This episode is brought to you by Tome Tombs. When your loved ones finally shuffle off their mortal coil, going on to enjoy eternal joy amid crystal lakes and the tree of life, the inevitable question arises for their family. What to do with what's left over? The remains, as they say. It's their body, that part of them you picture when you remember them, just like that bright yellow leisure suit they wore every day. What do we do with it? Throw it away? That doesn't feel right. Give it away? Who would take it? Bury it? Cremate it? It's a bright yellow leisure suit, so both of those are good options. But Tome Tombs gives your loved one's corpse the final respectful treatment they deserve. To be pressed between the pages of a massive book like a blue bonnet plucked by a 19th century romantic poet. It's Tome Tombs. They take your departed dear heart's discards and press them into the pages of a giant seven-foot hardcover book where they dry and flatten and can be conveniently tucked away on a bookshelf as a mushed keepsake. Then, years later, as their descendants are reading to their toddlers, Who's that, little Beatrice? Why, that's your great-uncle Abner. Yes, well, that's very much the way he looked when he was alive. And you can choose the books you want them pressed into. Maybe a science fiction romance by Edwin A. Abbott, or Hemingway's dry, unpretentious prose. Anything from a Thomas Harris self-help book to a Ford Econoline owner's manual, or the German edition of a Martha Stewart cookbook. Tome Tombs is the way to romantically memorialize your ancestors, and one day your entire family can spend eternity between the covers of the same book for convenient perusal. And thank you, Tome Tombs, for sponsoring the Rereading Wolf podcast. This episode is brought to you by the support of generous listeners just like you. You can learn how to be one of them at patreon.com slash rereadingwolf. And thank you, listener patrons, for supporting the Rereading Wolf podcast. Warning. The following discussion is deliberately riddled with spoilers and unhinged speculation on this nearly 40-year-old book, Gene Wolfe's The Book of the New Sun. You can't read a Gene Wolfe story. You can only reread a Gene Wolf story. Welcome to Rereading Wolf. We don't pretend that this is the first time you and we have read these books. We want to understand them in as much detail as possible, and that means considering the works as a whole. Hi, I'm James Wynn. And I'm Craig Brewer. Hi, Craig. Hello. I'm not sleepy anymore, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, we don't have to tell people that we're recording this later than we usually do because I fell asleep. At, at eight old. at night. And, yeah, we, we won't. I, I guess I'm just old. I don't. I, didn't, I don't usually do that, but there you go. There it is. So. He chimed in at ten thirty. Hey, I just woke up. I woke up to a couple little pings from James. Like I'm ready to go, man. You ready? You good? Hello. <laughs> I guess not. Okay. <laughs> and, so. So I do. I humbly apologize, but not that anyone else knows. I don't have to out myself like that. But. Well, you know, you know, when you've exposed your faults. Then you know what that means. You're open to correction. And Craig, we have corrections. Ah, well done. Hey, you was wrong. You was wrong. That was a nice segue. That was very good. <laughs> that, was, that was on the fly, too. Actually. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mike Lejeune, he says, regarding our conversation from last chapter, where Severian walks into the picture room and the author explains, hey, well, you know, the the machines here uh, detected your weapon. And I said, well, yeah, but he didn't really draw his weapon. And because, you know, sometimes when I write down these summaries, I don't always get it right. So well, it wasn't uh, just you. I actually went back and reread that section too. Look, but I was looking for one specific way it happened. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Well, he says detecting terminus est, the autarch says that it was detected when Severian entered the door, not when he drew it. He's not lying. Yeah. 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 And it says that, as you quoted, um, you know, your entrance with that great weapon caused a real wall to rise behind you to detain you until you had been examined. <laughs> so, yeah, the uh, entrance with the weapon, nothing to do with it being drawn. Very good point. Very good. Thanks, Mike. And also, Mike says uh, the wire wrappings the do- on the door is simply an inductive sensor. Devices working on the same principle are used all the time in industrial automation. And, oh, I just realized any metal detector in an airport. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, keeping us on the straight and narrow. Appreciate that. Means a lot. Could not do this without you guys. 
Austin Beeman, he uh, says, Rudison, any chance he's an inhumi? Always getting a creepy vibe off of him. And the size changing, long fingers and faux backstory lead into this. Uh, probably, he says it's probably not true, but weird curettes, earthquakes idea. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I'm, I, I admit I'm not crazy about the inhumi idea for a lot of reasons. Um, but on the other hand, and I can't get into this for another 12, 15 years, but <laughs> I think that there is some validity to that. So there. Yeah, yeah just, I still, the, the whole inhumi item, I don't know. <laughs> Not here. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, Sean Michael Robinson also on Facebook. Then I dream about be a Robinson true soul. He says, let me just start by saying, I think the description of Fetchin's paintings seem consistent with the style and skills of one Nikolai Fetchin, a truly fantastic portrait artist whose overlap with the, quote, drippers and spitters of our timeline would seem to make him an obvious model for Book of the New Sun Fetchin. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I got to tell you, Craig, as I mentioned to you, I took such a deep dive on Nikolai Fetchin <laughs> at one point. And he also says, and also his given subject area of interest, it seems likely that he had more than his monkey hands in common with Father and Neri. Could be. And the one thing that really fascinated me about Fetchin was how I, I read a, a piece about his process where if you, so if you don't know the the Russian Fetchin, um, if you look at his works, they look like, they're not abstractions really, but what they are they are is they're a little bit more, Impressionistic. Like, it, they're more like impressionistic stuff, but they're, it's not as much playful with color. Um, but what mm -hmm. he would do is he would really sketch out a, often a portrait, like primarily people or figures, um, a portrait, and it would be basically be pretty realistic. But then what he would do was as he added paint and color, he would then start to you know smudge or abstract or whatever. And so in the end, you get these things that do look like you said, kind of impressionistic, just not, just, you know, not as much of the color smudging that I think of often as impressionistic, mm -hmm. but, but it would happen after the fact. And it's sort of like what he was choosing to emphasize and, and what he was choosing to um, sort of make more ambiguous and, and they, which I have to admit, I kind of like, because I often wondered if that's how Wolf did things. Like I, if he told a straight story and then he's like, okay, how can I make this more fun by, yeah telling a different version of the story and making things weirder and, and hiding things or, or now I've written this story. Now, how would a character who doesn't recognize this, see what's going on? Um, which would be cool, which yeah, would um, be a fun connection. Because we know that Wolf has said in interviews that he, he didn't like draw maps or, mm -hmm. or make outlines or anything like that. If any kind of backstory, he was making it up in his head. As he went, he would keep track. He felt very confident that he could keep track of all of that going on, which is um, pretty remarkable in, its, in itself, right? Yeah. But the thing is, you know, like I said, I went, I took a deep dive on Fetchin, and yeah, they're portrait painters, but I'm always, I'm always trying to come up with the reason why. And that is the thing that always stopped me with Nikolai Fetchin. I couldn't figure out why Nikolai Fetchin would be incorporated into this story. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, maybe, yeah, I, I, I see the point. I see, it, it seems hopeful and that there's a, cause there's a painter called Fetchin and yet, and yet, and yet, I don't know. I, no, don't, I forget. We'll... Did we look it up? Was there a St. Fetchin? Should... Yeah. Yeah. There, oh, yeah, there, there was. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's definitely a St. Fetchin. I suddenly if, blanked. Yeah. Because I was if, like, oh. if they aren't, saint names and you know there's something um, right off right. kilter about them typhon um talos baldanders mm -hmm. yeah and fetchin's name has come up did we talk about the saint he was an irish saint right of uh, over an abbey he died of a plague in um 60 665 there we go 665 um not a big tie-in with Fetchin. Maybe he did like Fetchin. Maybe he did like Nikolai yeah. Fetchin, but that's not enough reason for me. I, I Wolf does better than that. So yeah, and I don't remember to him saying much about painting in interviews. I don't recall. I should. Well, I mean, obviously, if he's him, but, um, he's making a big deal of it here, he, he yeah. must have had some kind of interest. Oh yeah. 
But I don't know. For me, the search goes on. Yes, I I I acknowledge that point, Nikolai Fetchin. I think that maybe because it seems like such a coincidence that it was a touch point with Wolf. But I don't know anything in Fetchin's life story that makes me say, oh, it's just like this here. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. He does better. Wolf does better, I believe. <laughs> And also, um, Shawn Michael Robinson thinks that you are right, that the reason Rudison looks bigger when he looks down the hallway is has to do with all of the distorted features of the of the rooms and all. And yeah, I don't know. Well, look, I'm just saying he's in the hallway. He's not in a room. And the, so I did my best. If I can't convince you, I can't convince you. <laughs> Yeah, it is. And the one thing that might be a problem with that is if it is the fact that the hallway itself has weird perspective, he never mentions that as he gets closer. Yep. I mean, it might maybe it's some kind of really subtle version right. of that that makes it seem longer than yeah. it really is. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe yeah, you want, he wants the, the hallways to seem longer than they really are. Mm -hmm. That'd be interesting. Mm -hmm. But then he would look smaller. Um. Well, of course, if the hallways are looking smaller and he doesn't, then he would look big. But ugh, I don't know. Anyway, Shawn Michael Robinson says, I believe Rudison in the final chapter of Book of the New Sun is just what he says he is. He says he was placed there by Aniri to direct Severian to where he was desired to go. Well, yeah. you know, Craig, I believe he was placed there by Father Aniri as well and to give those instructions. But the, I mean, the point is that uh, Shawn Michael Robinson says, I, I think he was specifically told to deliver his true backstory because it would humanize him or possibly because of the quite elaborate family relationship that awaits Severian in Kazdo's cabin, Rudison's fetchin anecdote being the key to unraveling it. Hmm. Hmm. Could be. And either way, one thing that is pretty obvious, like we said last time too, is that Rudison being there and giving those directions is finally sort of a clue that, oh, there is a bigger uh, conspiracy going on, that they do know that Severian is coming. Mm -hmm. um, we don't still know exactly why anybody <laughs> seems to know that he's coming or whatnot, mm -hmm. but this is the part where it is definitely confirmed that lots of people are watching him and sort of pulling some strings. Yeah, yeah, just aspects. just like when uh, Zaveria makes it to Alton, there's some purpose in him being directed to that point. Yep. And yep. by the same token, you know, Rudison is here to make sure that Zaveria gets to where he's supposed to go. Yep. Let's see, on email, Stephen Frug checked in. Haven't heard from him in a while. And I can do the Frug. Stephen says, Gary Owens. Gary, Indiana. What a wonderful name. Was completely correct about the son being a thesis in the uh, tale of the student and his son. And he says, we have word of God on that from the essay, Books in the Book of the New Sun. Not in Castle of Days, but found it in Wright's Shadows of the New Sun. Uh, he also says, by the way, that I know that Gary Owens' last name is in Indiana, but thanks to his musical tag, that is now how I think of him. <laughs> <laughs> and he also stipulates that the Shadows of the New Sun he had were the Peter Wright version, not the collection of short stories based on Wolf's works that has the exact same title. Yeah. He says, shame on them for not taking half an hour to come up with a genuinely new title. I, 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 thought, I thought for about three minutes and came up with several that were pretty good. They should talk to me. <laughs> anyway, he says that Wolf said in the last chapter of that essay, Books in the Book of the New Sun, in writing the legends, I have supposed facts and old stories to have become confused with others, a rascally technique which has earned me at least one venomous accusation of plagiarism. <laughs> Thus, for example, the custom of academic thesis is confounded with the legend of Theseus in the tale of the student and his son. Very good. Well done. And I had an interesting conversation with Mantis so on his first Severian tale of the student post in Reddit, in the Rereading Wolf podcast subreddit. It's fascinating to me in that you know, we get so many different readings out of this text 
and not trivial readings. I mean, readings by people who have read the text over and over, and, you know, it makes me doubt myself. Uh, Mantis thinks there's no body in the mausoleum. He thinks the first Severian is already resurrected a long time ago, that the door off its hinge is like the stone being rolled away from the tomb. And as I said, you know, well, wait a minute. The Severian says, quote, the dead man lay at full length, his heavy-lidded eyes closed. In the light that pierced the little window, I examined his face and meditated on my own as I saw it in the polished meadow. My straight nose, deep-set eyes, and sunken cheeks were much like his, and I longed to know if he too had dark hair. It strikes me that you know, this is obvious, but Mantis says, no, man. <laughs> Severian is looking at the funeral bronze of the immediately previous sentence, and his gaze is twofold, at the artwork depicting the dead man and at his own face in the dark mirror of its surface. I don't know. I don't know, Craig. I don't know if I'm convinced, but I'm open to being convinced. I mean, it's, you know, it's Mr. Lexicon Earthus. Yeah, getting down to the grammar level of the sentence for references like that, there have been a few times when that's been an issue. I know, yeah. like, like exactly what is Wolf referring to. Yeah, yeah, I have that a lot. Uh, let's see, on on Patreon, journeyman patron Carl says, uh, regarding the lack of comments on the last episode, one, it was a fantastic episode. Great to have you both back. <laughs> Two, love the segment after the outro music. See, there, I told you they would like that. <laughs> our, very, our random off-topic rambling. Yeah, <laughs> very much looking forward to the rereading Tolkien podcast. Oh my god! You don't need free time, do you? <laughs> you just sit around and reread the rereadings of the drafts of <laughs> with comments on Christopher Tolkien's comments on the drafts that there Tolkien commented oh, on. Oh, on his wonderful! Own. <laughs> <laughs> we can go through the history of Middle Earth uh, series. <laughs> Seriously, if you haven't read the History of Middle Earth series, you should. It's yes, 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 yes. Great, great. It looks beautiful on my shelf, though, too. I know. It's all that's nice to have that many books that, that all fit that. Yeah, yeah. And let's see, also on Patreon, uh, Master Patron Matthew Ellers I had an uncle named Matthew. Has his own First Severian theory. It's that First Severian hooked up with Valeria after becoming Autark. Being not such a great person, he decides to improve himself with, you know, our Severian, Severian too, via the corridors of times. And he tells Valeria's plan, and she agrees, but only on the condition that the new and improved Severian too and her must still end up together. See, she's tired of the old lousy Severian as well. So mm. maybe first Severian, our father Aniri, manipulates events for Severian too to meet Valeria and to ensure that their paths cross and cement their future together. And he admits that, you know, there's little supporting text, and he's not really convinced himself, but he says, quote, the whole Valeria backstory is such a void, so why not? I agree. I agree. And this might explain why Severian, he says, is so loath to explain their situation or the conversational details of their first encounter. He repeats, quote, utterly speculative, but fun to tinker with. <laughs> Amen. And one other thing we should mention, news. There is some wolf news in the world, and that is that there are new audiobook versions of Long Sun oh, on yes. Audible. They were released on the 8th, 8th of March. And I actually, I haven't even listened to a clip yet. I keep meaning to look at it, but I'm, I'm looking at the covers that Audible made for them. There, there are some issues <laughs> with, <laughs> with the spaceships that they show that are um, not asteroids. So that's a problem, <laughs> but, um, but there is one cool for Litany of the Long Sun. They've got, um, it's like Silk standing next to some giant um, robot guy, but he's on the surface of a planet looking at a sun otherwise. So that doesn't quite right. So these are obviously like cribbed from somewhere else. That's okay. But <laughs> the one fun bit of information is that Mantis says that he has heard that there are indeed short sun audiobooks in the works. Oh. I don't know. I, I don't, he didn't tell us where, how he knows that exactly. But if that's the case, I know a lot of you guys like me will be very happy. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, how, how awful would it be to do long sun and then not do short sun? Short sun I think I they're know. committed. Yeah, they, I mean, it is the same story. That's right. Yeah, oh, yeah, I think so. I think so. I think it's one seven volume yeah. novel. 
Oh, and they have Shadows of the New Sun too. I didn't realize that. In, in audiobook? Yeah. In, They've got oh, the stories, not the Dude, yeah, you guys, yeah, you should definitely listen to those. That's I'm I mean, way behind. You, that cannot you know, I, I find it hard to listen to uh the Book of the New Sun and a lot of Wolf's works because you know, it's kind of like listening to poetry and you, I mean, so like lyrical poetry, yes, you can get a lot of it by listening because it's all about rhythm and the sound. Mm -hmm. You get some some of that free verse or that modernistic poetry. And, you know, it's just not the same thing. <laughs> I have to read it. I have to look at it with gotcha. my eyeballs. I hear different things. Like I, I have gone through, like actually, I think when we first started this, I was only, no, I was doing both because I would listen first and then go back and read with a pencil uh just to to mark things but i mean it's i like it and there's two versions of new sun out there uh two different guys the original ones were done for specifically for uh audiobooks for the blind like they weren't ever meant to right, really right. be out there but i know audible had them or did audible have them for a while or the first one may only exist on youtube at this point <laughs> I'm really sure i guess i guess i guess what they say is right there's a there's a genesons and, uh, you know, the, look at all these years we went by without any kind of an, uh, you know, an audible book of Book of the New Sun or any of Gene's stuff. And now everybody, we, we may actually get the entire uh, set of Wolf's works in audible form before we get them in print form. So, Could be. Yeah. Hey, we got a Apple podcast review. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. This is from... Malaclips the third. <laughs> Very good. Pope, <laughs> Fnord, and Hail Eris. <laughs> well, this was the title is uh, Curiositus Earthus. And five stars. He says, I enjoy all three of the Wolf podcasts in different ways, but now I'm catching up on this one, still a year or so behind. This is fast becoming my favorite. And uh, he's got a nice English accent. So. He says, being uh, spoiler laden allows the host to address the clues that tie in with various theories and interpretations as they come up and discuss them with some great guests. Well, that does sound like us. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank, thank you, Malaclips the third. Yeah. And to your senior, Malaclips Jr., and to Malaclips the, uh, the Younger. And do you know Malaclips the Younger? That's one of the two guys who started Discordianism. Principia Discordium. Malaclips the Younger was the name that he used. Oh, I didn't know so, that. Yeah, so that's that's totally a uh, Church of Discordia no. shout out. And well, that's perfect. Illuminatus <laughs> and Robert Anton Wilson and everything. So. You keep the crooks and charlatans and business babe. But do you appreciate your An odd thing seems to happen when you put out episodes on a fairly regular basis, and apparently people seem to appreciate it. We've got a bunch of new patrons to thank this time, for which we are as grateful as a green man with a new file. Uh, first, we have two new journeyman patrons, Steve Wallenfels and Dr. Blood Money, which is certainly his given name. And we have three new master level patrons. So thank you to Greg Adams. <laughs> Matthew Clay Luck. And Mike Dreckschmidt. Remember that you can get access to all the extra content on Patreon by signing up for just $2 a month, the journeyman level. Master level is $5 a month, where we'll give you a musical tag for your comments, stickers, and other goodies. And a new little thing that we just started, which is an invitation to a Slack channel for big time theory slingers to come and chat and try out new ideas with each other. We just thought it'd be fun to have a spot to test out uh, any extended comments or theories you might have before we read them and just generally have some fun with other wolf nerds. So if you're on the master level at Patreon, please check your email because you should have received an invitation to Slack, which if you don't know what Slack is, uh, it's a real time chat program similar to Discord, which I know a lot of people know from gaming. Uh, James and I use it all the time to talk about the show and share ideas. And this just seemed like a fun thing to try. OK, well, Craig, we've left uh Severian and uh this the creepy pimp in kind of a spot so we probably ought to just go ahead and and hurry up and move on because they've been standing in freeze frame for yeah. an entire two weeks you, you never want to leave someone with an awkward yeah. creepy yeah. pimp for too long <laughs> no one wants that 
Chapter 21, Hydromancy. Yeah, uh, the title of this chapter is Hydromancy, which is divination by the observation, by some use of, or from some phenomenon of water. It includes, you know, the practice of just staring into the water, which is essentially the same as staring into a crystal ball. According to legend, it was a practice founded by Nearest, the shape-shifting old man of the sea, the the father of the Nearid mermaids. Now there we have something interesting. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like the parent of mermaids. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, and which, I don't know. I don't know if that tells us any of the provenance of this fountain or not. Probably not. I guess that this is Yasadi technology, although I don't really understand the right. technology, right? No, it's I don't just either, weird. But- I was just thinking Abaya, but that's a that's a different stretch. That's a different part of the thing. Yeah. So uh, Severian is going to encounter the fortune-telling fountain in this chapter, but uh, the first half of this chapter, as I said in the last episode, uh, sort of goes with last chapter, just like you know, the end of chapter 16 of Shadow, where uh, Severian encounters Aji and then goes that that goes with chapter 17 where it's very in bargains with agilis and gets a challenge to a duel it, this is an interaction with a picture uh the hydromancy doesn't come up until the very end and that is of course you know typical for a wolf title right but i was wondering if there is something about hydromancy in the first part because of course the first part has two major things that or I guess you'd call it three, maybe even, I mean, we are going to have the vision. We're also going to have Severian realizing who he's talking to. And we also have a sort of twist about who that guy is connected to. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's a ton in that first chapter. It's very odd for him to decide to title a chapter, something that, you know, the Hydrancy part is weird. It's unique for it sure. Weird. But it, I mean, it's not unique, it, right? Because we got the rag shop at the. At I the, guess it's true. Although, if you figure that the um, the lambrequin, yeah, the lambrequin, yeah, yeah, maybe that's uh, maybe maybe there is some sort of um, you know structural beginning and end for Could be. the rag so, shop. And I don't know. I was trying like instead of hydromancy. I mean, we do have him bleeding. Right. Mm. In a oh, so yeah, I'm like yeah. trying to think what is the liquid in the first part? That's the obvious one. So uh, but but we'll see. We'll see when we get to that. We'll see if there's anything about divination at yeah. all that would come from that. Maybe. Or water or water. Yeah. And as you, luck may have it, uh, the last chapter pictures ended with the Autark giving the secret password that Severian was told by Vodalist to expect yeah. to receive from his secret agent in House Absolute, the Pelagic Argosy sites land. So there's some water there. Yep. Yep. And I should repeat that although I was very paranoid about the Autarch's role in House Azure, I'm less now. I think the Autarch is at House Azure when he wants to be. Maybe House Azure is shut down now, you know, or mostly shut down. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Or if not, then someone besides the Autarch stands in as the pimp. I think Rosha is, or at least was, working as the Autarch's spy, and Severian's trip to House Azure was arranged. I have no idea how many layers of subterfuge were involved in that. Maybe it was mostly coincidence, but Roche's choice of a brothel that night was surely designed. I think yeah. the Kaibits have no rights as persons. Um, I've mentioned that. They're no more than property in the Commonwealth society, valuable property to the exultants, as I said, uh, but not irreplaceable property. He does have to, you know, have to make an effort to keep the Kaibits engaged in his little hobby, which gives him <laughs> and Severian's mother a reason to hang around <laughs> Severian as he grew up and get information from his spies at the Madison. To Vodalus, the Autarch is some official functionary in the House Absolute and is his spy. And now that the Autarch has delivered the passcode for Severian, the Autarch is both the pimp at the House Azure and Vodalus's agent. Mm-hmm. So at first, uh, Severian is not sure he's heard what the Autarch said or what it meant, but, quote, then the remembered scent of Thecla's roasted flesh rose sickeningly sweet in my nostrils, and I seemed to feel the unquiet of the leaves. 
it's unclear, even to Severian, how much the Al Zabo and his joining to Thecla was to bind Severian to Votilus. But he wasn't able to throw away that steel blade that Votilus gave him, even though Severian, for some reason, no longer considers himself a follower of Votilus. And now, when he hears the passcode delivered by the Autarch, he remembers that moment under the influence of the Alzabo when Votilus gave him instructions. And so mm -hmm. it's just him and this hermaphrodite in this room. But Severian still looks around to see if anyone's listening. And then listen to this. Then found that without my having willed it, my hand had taken the knife-shaped steel from the innermost compartment of my saber tash. So what he intended to do was to question him a bit before you know, giving away that he was connected to Votilus, but it's automatic, just as Votilus promised. It's and it's a mystery. And the Autarch smiles and he says he suspected Severian was the guy he'd been waiting for for days. And not only that, but he says that there have been people stationed all over the place to intercept Severian. Perhaps, Craig, each of the people were some version of Rudison. I don't. I don't know. Mm -hmm. He says. Quote, I have kept the old man outside and many others under instructions to bring promising strangers to me. He does say that if he'd shown up at some other point in the house, he would have had to walk further to where, you know, to the room to read the, the message. So maybe not. The Autar doesn't say that he's examined other people, however. How much of this is a plausible cover story and how much is genuine is just not something that we're given information about. Yeah. It seems to me that based on what Rudison said last chapter, that it is Father Aniri who has stationed him in the hallway and probably, I think, maybe only recently. And Severian says that he was late because he was stuck in the antechamber and the Autarch deduces that he escaped. Uh, he intended to send a guy to check the antechamber, but he hasn't yet. And he doesn't think that it was likely that Severian could get official release without the autarch's help himself. And the autarch says, quote, there isn't much time left, the three days of theasis, and then I must go. Come, and I will show you the way to the garden, though I am by no means sure you will be permitted to enter. But he knows that he will. Because, you know, I, I, the autarch knows he can get him in. This is, you know, the autarch playing his role. I guess most people in the House Absolute don't know what the autarch looks like, and he just wanders through the halls looking like a steward. But, you know, the yellow robe, that's a uniform that designates some executive authority. Remember, the mayor of Saltus wore a yellow robe. So, let's see, the autarch opens the single door in the room the one that he entered through. It's not rectangular, so that means it's clearly you know on the side wall, not the back wall. It's using weird angles to make the room look larger than it actually is. And the next room is not much larger than the little shallow room, but it doesn't have weirdly shaped angled walls because it's not disguised as a picture. And Sverian says it was, quote, richly furnished. Apparently, there are, like I said, some other ways to the secret house that Severian might have taken, just as we'd expect. He says that if he had entered by another route, he'd have had to walk a long way to get to this room. And Severian doesn't know what's special about this room yet. Yeah. And I wonder, too, if the little hole in being in the walls, I assume that was part of the second house, right? When he's talking about seeing where uh, Buzek went, and then he has that little like like we talked about in Earth, he talks about, you know, the wolves that lived in the walls. I wonder if that's part of the second house, too. If everything that they mean by the second house is all the kind of hidden thing. Or if the it walls be really are them. just somewhere it's, between the two houses. Yeah. It's the second forest where all the, yeah. the wolves and <laughs> wild men live. Yeah. On first Severian level, this meeting is not one that would have happened to the first Severian. The Autarch had apparently not been informed of the first Severian. So this meeting, and I think the picture he's about to look at, this is unique to our Severian. Then uh, the Autarch goes to read the letter. He crossed to what I at first supposed was a glass top table and put the steel under it on a shelf. At once a light kindled, shining down from the glass, though there was no light above it. The steel grew until it seemed a sword, and its striations, in place of mere teeth on which to strike sparks from a flint, I saw to be lines of flowing script. 
So, you know, it's like one of those bathtub animals that you put in the water and it grows. <laughs> the steel thing. The the autark puts it under a special light and it grows so that you can see the writing on it. Uh, the autark says, stand back. If you've not read this before, you must not read it now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's a very end backs away and watches and he watches the autark read the message. And apparently this is information about the Vodalari and the Asian attack that's coming up. And that's why the autark has to leave in three days to fight the war, not to go to work in House Azure. And he says, quote, there is no help for it then. We must fight on two flanks. But this is none of your affair. Uh, something else in this message is that Vodalus tells him that Severian is carrying the claw of the conciliator, what he will do with this information. It seems to me that Vodalus has said, quote, this guy was carrying the claw of the conciliator and I told him to throw it away. If he still has it, collect it from him. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll never know. But now, for the first time, the Autark has this information. So if Agia is part of a plot to get the claw into Severian's hands, then at least the Autark and maybe even Father Aniri is not part of that plan. Yeah, and that's an interesting point that if we're talking about like who's moving things around in the back, this is one place where we can kind of see how there might be places where not everybody is part of the same conspiracy, right? <laughs> right? Like yeah. if Agia is doing it, that would be one thing. First Severian could be doing something on his own. Um, which the Autark and Aniri maybe don't know about. Yeah. We just we don't really know. But it is interesting that they're that the logic of it does suggest different different conspirators with with different reasons. If yeah, if right. there even is that specificity. Yeah, the Autark says he claims he didn't even know that Thecla had been sent to the mm -hmm. Madison Tower. Um, I, I, of course, I, I doubt that. For some, I have many reasons to doubt that. But it would. But it, it seems that maybe her being sent to the match and he might not have been involved with. So like you said, yeah. there are many conspiracies in this common Yeah. And if Aniri is the one really pulling the strings, then this Artark may just be like Severian, just another, another guy who's being pulled. And right. So he yeah. May not Good point. Really know all the details. Yeah. yeah. So the Autark points to a cabinet with a special symbol carved on it. An eclipse. I assume it's, you know, like an eclipse of the sun, but I think it's a symbol in this world, like a, a diamond or a heart or a spade or a fleur de lis, so, because the Autark calls it not an eclipse, but the eclipse. Mm -hmm. And he says he should open the cabinet and get the book inside and then put it on the stand that the Autark read the steel on. And Severian figures that it's a trap, but he still does as he's told. Yeah. Just one other thing about the eclipse. Yeah. Whether it is that kind of symbol or not, it is interesting how quickly he refers to it, right? Like right. It's, it's so casual that it does seem like maybe it is that kind of shape. Uh, but it also is possible that, I mean, a, a picture of an eclipse, that's hard. Like, like yeah. to imagine really what we're thinking of, unless we're thinking of like one circle with just a little sliver yeah. of a crescent showing. I mean, which I honestly would not immediately think of as an eclipse. I don't know. But yeah, it's not the kind of thing, like if it is just supposed to be a weird symbol, we'll chose a really good one because it's not one that you can immediately picture what it is. <laughs> it's yeah. sort of like, I, I mean, it could be ah. just like a, it could be like a, a circle with a dark circle around it. I mean, there's so many things it could yeah. be. Yeah. Which is why it's so cool for right. that that effect. Yeah. And uh, it's a huge book. It's nearly six feet long and a full three feet wide, two cubits. It's not lying flat. It's standing up. Its cover is, quote, mottled blue, green leather. Blue and green, Craig. Mm -hmm. And Severian suggests that it's the color of a moldering corpse, quote, facing me much as a corpse might have had I opened the lid in an upright casket. Uh, yeah. This is not a metaphor. So Varian yeah. explains a little later that when he looks at the cover, yeah, he saw a dead man in the leather and that he was myself. Yeah. And this is another interesting use of the word book. Like the way Severian describes it is I opened the cabinet and there was this giant book. But for me, anything that's six feet tall <laughs> is not immediately going to register as a book, right? And he's going to open it up eventually, and it's it's not – it doesn't have pages, right? It has these mirrors. Um, but my point is that that's either Wolf having fun with making Severian 
carry a giant book something <laughs> yeah um but but it also could be a point that that in severian's very limited experience this is kind of the only way the the closest thing he could describe to something right. that that just folded open like that uh, but it may actually not i mean apart from the fact that he says it has like uh leather um on the outside uh, otherwise i i almost have trouble picturing this as anything like a book but i don't know i don't know no well in uh wolf's uh collection biblomen he, he has one little short uh, vignette of, of a man. He's a, like, a, I can't remember, maybe a bookbinder or something like that. But he has this giant book as tall as he is. And he's a little mm. guy and he gets mashed in there like uh, you, like when you put flowers in a, in a book yeah. and you press them between the pages. <laughs> yeah. And that happens to him. Yeah, it was darkly funny. <laughs> I don't know if you ever read, if anyone's ever read the the Flat Stanley books to their kids, but <laughs> that's kind of the same same idea, right? Exactly. Um, as for that dead man that Severian saw, I think we all agree that the dead man in the leather is the corpse in Severian's mausoleum, and that dead man was himself. And we might not all agree on how the dead man is himself, but we can certainly agree on where the corpse can be found at this moment. And Severian is still carrying his sword that he pulled when he entered the picture room in the last chapter. And now he sheaths it and he picks up the book with both hands and puts it on the stand. So the autarch opens the cover on the first page, is writing in red is a script that he doesn't recognize. Red seems to be the ink color of official documents in the Commonwealth. I think Severian speaks of writing his memoir in red ink. And the autarch says that the writing is, quote, a warning to the seekers of the path and asks the Severian wants it read to him. He, he'll actually never get around to reading the warning. And so, quote, the path will also remain obscured. And the autarch asks if he'd ever seen the book before, which is a strange question to ask, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's one place, honestly, where I was wondering, is is that the first Severian? Well, he is told, question? right? He is told by, we aren't told who, but he is told that of Severian's coming. So he might well assume that, you know, Sever, Severian may have seen this book before. Everyone knows he's going to, you know, take the test. So maybe he's already seen the book. Yeah. Or it could be a question of, you know, have you used something like this before? Like he might mm, not mean, yeah, he maybe might, seen another, have you I mean, seen this another specific book. thing, but have you seen another one? Are you familiar with this technology? Are you kind of in the know as far as that stuff goes? Yeah. It, it could mean so many things. Right. Right. And the autarch knows, you know, he's the focus of many powers besides himself. Perhaps father and has arranged for Severian to be shown the book, or perhaps yeah. master Mal Rubius has shown up carrying this book. And in some ways he has seen it before, right? He's seen Jonas enter the mirrors and he's heard mm -hmm. it. And I know it's not exactly the same one, but he has seen the same kind of contraption and heard stories about it via Thecla. Yeah. So, yeah. But he says he's, uh, the reason he, do, he he did ask is that he knows that Severian kind of looked afraid of the book. Mm -hmm. He says, you look fearful of it and tried, as it appeared to me, to keep your face from it when you carried it. Uh, he's scrutinizing Severian's reaction to this book for some reason. And Severian says that the reason he wasn't looking at it was because he was seeing that dead man in the mottled leather. And the autarch closes the book and they discuss the cover. He, the autarch says, these pavanine dyings. Pavanine means resembling peacock feathers in dis color, design, or iridescence. And I suspect... Every instance of peacock imagery connected to the autark is a reference to this book, whose colors and designs are entirely coincidental. However, he says, um, these pavanine dyings. Uh, Craig, is there ever in this book so far that we have encountered that word, pavanine? Uh, shoot, I don't remember. Well, uh, I do. I'm sure you do. <laughs> Cuz I know because, you've been searching through the flex box. <laughs> well, Severian said that when he encountered Agia, she quote wore a pavanine brocade gown of amazing richness and raggedness ah. and as I watched her the sun touched a rent just below her waist, turning the skin there to the palest gold. 
So if you want to build a theory that Agia is just a tool of the Yasadis to get Severian to where he's supposed to be, this is a, you know, a really nice reference to include in your theory. That's nice. Now, is that the same dress that she wore later or did she change? Was that the dress he saw when she was in no, the street? No, no, yeah. Yeah, I think like okay. when they go to the, I think that's the same dress that she's wearing when they go to the, um, you know, the Garden of Endless Sleep and oh, such. okay. Interesting. I'll have to, I, I'm curious to check because if it is this kind of, you know, they says these craftsmen are long gone and, and it's, and, and granted he's talking about leather on the book cover, but something about the dying here, you can certainly dye cloth mm -hmm. just like you could dye leather. Um, but I wonder if that would have something to do with her trying to seduce Severian, if that's what she's wearing. Anyway, I'll go check sure. that later because I yeah. just don't remember. Yeah. So anyway, the Autark says, uh, these Pavanine dyings are but the work of craftsmen long gone. The lines and swirls beneath them are only the scars of the suffering animals' backs, the marks of ticks and whips. Mm. So how did Severian see a corpse in the cover? Uh, I don't know. Maybe this is just another instance of Severian's power of presentiment. Uh, Could be. Done? Yeah. It's it's also the kind of thing where it's, you know, if there are all these marks, it could be a bit of the Rorschach effect, right? That's mm -hmm. certainly possible. Um, but I also wonder if whatever that sort of chaos or strange things that you can project something on, it certainly seems like it could also be affected by whatever else is going on on the inside of the books, which is bringing things from yeah. other planes or places or times or whatever and and we don't know it's all it's all suggestive but yeah. um but yeah i like the idea that there's something about some old craft here which <laughs> you know who knows what that means in terms of technology um that something else all kinds of layers of some other technology yeah. or who knows scrying even i mean uh, uh, hey we were looking for hydromancy right a dye a dye <laughs> oh, is yeah, that's a good water point, yeah. and if it's sort of doing this this chaotic thing that you then or supposedly random thing and with all the marks of the real creatures then you could read something from it you definitely perhaps. could yeah hmm. that's a stretch for hydromancy but hey it's, but well i mean we don't understand don't hydromancy and i don't understand how severian sees him sees a dead body that is himself in the cover of this book. I mean, a dead body. Oh, how, how, how weird and macabre to, to have some sort of abstract picture of a dead body on a car, but Severian's face himself. Mm -hmm. That's something. Um, yeah. So the autark says, quote, if you are fearful, you need not go. It need not go probably means one thing to the autark and one thing to Severian. To Severian, he thinks it means, you know, go to the, the uh, Thiasis. And I think the autark means, you know, go beyond the candles of the night, as Severian calls it mm -hmm. in the last chapter. Go to take the test, even though, you know, this is only very vaguely referred to in this book. Remember, they didn't even talk about doing Earth, the New Sun until, you know, maybe this volume was being prepared for publication. And Severian says, quote, open it, show me the map. <laughs> he still thinks he's going to see a map. And the Autark answers, there is no map. This is the thing himself. I still, I think the Autark seems to believe that Severian knows more about what's going on than actually he does. Mm -hmm. Because he's been told Severian is going to take the test. He thinks Severian is in on it. And it turns out, really, he no, I'm just wandering in here, man. Yeah. And I think when you first read it, all that stuff, if you are making sense of it, it's like, oh, he thinks that Vodalus has told him more or something. Right. Mm -hmm. I, like, I think that's the but but I think once you know more about what the book actually is and what it does, there, it's it's another layer of conspiracy. Uh, but I don't think you think Vodalus knows about this book. No, no, no. I mean that when you when you first read this chapter, it's the big reveal, right? Uh -huh. Is that, oh, this guy is in on the, the Vodalist thing. And so right. anytime he's sort of suggesting something, I think it's pretty, oh, oh, the, yeah. the safe read is, oh, he's thinks that this is Vodalist stuff. And right, he's right, right. thinking that, but that's not really what's going on. I think if there right. is that, yeah, it's like you said, it's, it's all about the, the bigger story. 
Right. And this is no map. It's the thing itself. It's like saying, it's, it's another idea of the of symbols in the real thing again. Uh, it's yep. like saying, show me the map of Houston. And this is not the map of Houston. This is Houston. And the closer a map is to the original, the more useless it is. Yep. The most precise map of Houston is Houston. Uh, it's, it's, and it's also not a useful map. No, no, I do. I funny on that point. I have for no good reason. I have a little marginal note here. Uh, Robert Anton Wilson, just <laughs> because one of his things that he liked to say a lot in a lot of his books was like, the map is not the territory. <laughs> and and it, it, there's always a difference between the way you understand something and what it actually is. But mm-hmm. here's, here's the, here's the autark saying, no, 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 this is the true thing yeah. itself not just information about it yeah. okay um so this is what severian actually sees when he opens it he says i was blinded almost as i've been on dark nights by a discharge of lightning the inner pages seemed a pure silver beaten and polished that caught every wisp of illumination in the room and flung it back amplified a hundred times so the pages in this book are like in mirrors and that's what Severian calls them. He says, they're mirrors. But even as he says that, he knows they're not really mirrors. The technology behind Aeneas mirrors could not be approached, no matter how carefully you polished your normal bathroom mirror. I had an online discussion recently about whether Aeneas' description of how these mirrors work made sense in you know physics. Uh, well, you know, not present day physics, but a lot of things in relativity, you know, physics and quantum physics don't make sense in Newtonian physics. You know, this is a world that's had several overturnings of physics in just that way. And remember, calling them mirrors is just an analogy. They're not mirrors. Right, right. And that's going to make sense when, you know, what the autarch's about to say, we're like, oh, they could have been have captured light as they're closed right. together forever and ever. You're like, well, that, that's not how mirrors work. You're like, yeah, but these yeah, are, yeah. Not, yeah. These are says, not just mirrors. Yeah. 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 And Severian says, you know, these are things for which we have no word, but mirrors. Yeah. Right. And if even Severian is saying that when you've already got the different layers of Wolf supposedly translating for, mm-hmm. like, then yeah. yeah. Uh, now, as I've said, uh, Severian had the way like he had the way of this, these mirrors, you know, the, the way they they work explained to him in Thecla's story and Thecla's memory of her story. So he thinks, quote, but how can they have power when they don't face each other, right? They're supposed to face each other. Yeah. And remember, remember in chapter 20, Shadow of the Torturer, when Aniri explains how the mirrors work and says that they have to be positioned opposite each other for a while. And the autark answers, consider how long they faced each other when the book was closed. Now the field will withstand the tension we put on it for some time. Again, these are not just clever mirrors. They're generating a specific field of some kind that can be maintained by just the fact that they were facing each other. Yeah. And one little thing too, just that line when he's he's like, they're mirrors. It reminds me this time when I was reading it, I totally had 2001 in my head and my God, it's stars (laughs) in which, you know, it's not stars. It's whatever else is. There's something else. Yeah. Anyway, but, but I think that tone is right. Yeah, no, that works. When we do the movie, that will be the way we deliver it. So yeah. (laughs) Uh, The Artark says, um, quote, go if you dare. Is this the Artark suggesting that Severian dive into the pages of the book and go take the test? Well, he doesn't do that. But as the autark says, quote, go if you dare, something shaped itself in shining air above the open pages, unquote. Uh, a monster is escaping from the mirror pages like Hathor's critters or the animals that escape from the sails. For Aeneas mirrors, this takes a long time for the fish to form into something. Uh, anyway, that's my interpretation. But for these kinds of mirrors, they form almost instantly. The thing that is forming from the mirror pages, well, you read it. Okay, so here he goes. As he spoke, something shaped itself in shining air above the open pages. It was neither a woman nor a butterfly, but it partook of both. And just as we know when we look at the painted figure of a mountain in the background of some picture that it is in reality as huge as an island, So I knew that I saw the thing only from far off. Its wings beat, I think, against the proton winds of space, and all earth might have been a moat disturbed by their motion. Then, as I had seen it, so it saw me, 
much as the androgyne a moment before had seen the swirls and loops of writing on the steel through his glass. It paused and turned to me and opened its wings that I might observe them. They were marked with eyes. <laughs> so we're going to have to wait until Earth the New Sun to put a name on this mm-hmm. thing or understand how it matters. It's, of course, Zadkiel. And well, I, I will say it's it's a being like Zadkiel. That's when, when I always keep that asterisk, even though on a line, even back on the Earth list, I always it just went along with it. That, yeah, this this has to be Zadkiel. But we, we don't know if it is Zadkiel or if it is just a creature like Zadkiel. I guess that, that's true, but it, are, it are there any de- other Zadkiels? No, there's, we certainly don't ever see one. And and there's that that's a question. Like, are there other Zadkiels? Or is Zadkiel itself, himself, herself, whatever? Um, one thing, yeah. Anyway, that, that doesn't really matter. We, <laughs> that, that's a quibble way long down the line. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll fight over that. Uh, but, you know, frankly, I've, I've read the whole of earth, the new sun a couple times through, and I'm not a hundred percent what Zadkiel Mm -hmm. is anyway. So, yeah. One, one thing we do have to say is that, well, the eyes on the wings, I mean, he says that the wings open up and he says they were marked with eyes. And once we do that, we're getting into how the, the Bible talks about angels, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. 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 That's absolutely true. Yeah. A biblical angel is a a creature, a giant creature with different eyes. In fact, there's a, there's a picture or it's like an animated, a little, it's, I've seen it as a gif or whatever, but, but it's going around of an angel that kind of has that look that the, the sort of joke is like, yeah, biblical, biblically accurate angel is like a terrifying, (laughs) Um, but it's really cool. I'll, I'll try and find the link and post it. Um, I feel like somebody posted it or maybe I I sent sent it to you. I sent you the link. Was that you who sent me that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, But yeah, so, so you've got that. And that's always kind of, ever since I saw that, I'm like, that's that kill. That's what it's going to (laughs) be. But yeah. So, so here's the first thing where he has the butterfly and he has the woman, and that I think to us translates as angel. But the thing that really, for me, does angel is the eyes here on the wings. Because I think you're right about that. I think I think this. I think he's not just he's not just an angel. Look, an angel means messenger. Yeah. God. He's a seraph. Yeah. That's the word that's used. That and that and that for those verses in Isaiah where we get the seraphim is plural. Yeah. For that. Yeah. Um, um, and and by the way, uh, when we get to book of the short sun i have a lot to say about seraphs mm. so just saying <laughs> see you in 10 years <laughs> but i i was gonna think too with the peacock design that could be connected to the eyes as well if you want to push that but i i i can't help but think that the obvious thing he's doing here is just talking about what a biblical biblically accurate angel looks like and mm-hmm. its eyes on the wings I think you're right. I think you're right about that. Uh, let's see. And also in Earth and the New Sun, a Severian's going to encounter, like you said, a, a piece of Zadkiel that was mm-hmm. permanently thrown off and looks like a little butterfly woman. Yep. And we can see from this that Zadkiel is very big, much bigger than when Severian encounters him. The, the Megatherians are as big as mountains, and Zadkiel is something bigger. Her wings have eyes, like you said, on the tips like uh, peacocks or moths. And perhaps that's why the book is dyed Pavanine mm-hmm. colors, right? Yeah. And this is not like a portal, like the sails where the creatures pass into our universe from who knows where. Severian and Zadkiel are checking each other out through these mirrors, it seems. And yeah. maybe even Severian is not actually in that room while this is happening. Right. Notice, too, that in the quote, what he says is, um, then as I had seen it, so it saw me much as the androgyna moment before had seen the swirls and loops of writing on the steel. Well, what was happening when he looks at the steel? He's like enlarging it, right? Like it's, mm-hmm. it's this. And, and I'm, I got to admit, I'm still not sure if it's just a magnifying thing that he sees or if he actually does blow the steel up like a, a bathtub thing. But that either way, the point is Severian's being enlarged here, too. Right. At least not maybe not. I mean, certainly not physically in the room, but big enough so that he can be noticed and examined right, noticed by such by a Zadkiel. massive being like yeah. Zadkiel. So at yeah. the very least, metaphorically or communicatively or whatever. <laughs> but, but yeah, so <laughs> which is kind of cool because this is also a place where 
the Severian's getting himself quote unquote translated into a bigger story, right? For the first right. time where he's really starting to see that. And sort of metaphorically, he's being made massive, uh, being made important in some mm-hmm. way. Um, and so there is something there about, uh, I haven't worked out all the details yet, but there is something in there about becoming more symbol like, you know, with this, right. this vast change in size, there is some kind of, of connection to becoming more like the, the size of this giant angel thing. Yeah. And how weird that we have this whole scene and Wolf seems to have thought about what was going on here. Mm -hmm. Never explains it. Right. Not specifically. And in Mm -hmm. fact, when you combine it with that thing where the autark says, go, if you want to, you know, go if you dare, that's a weird little go and figure it out. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Because, well, it specifically, because it seems like, Whenever anyone talks about a conspiracy to get Severian on the throne and to get him to the test, it's this like we always assume it's this long involved process where he has to learn and change and become a mm-hmm. better person and serve as a type. Whereas here, this guy's just like, go ahead, yeah. <laughs> you know, like if you want to look in there. And I, I mean, it could just be a weird way of saying look if you dare, but go is different from look. And, um, and the idea that he's actually offering Severian a moment here to, I don't know, step out of the world. That's another aspect of this that always confused me Um, because I would have always thought that if, you know, it's part of the way that I always figured this was, this was a moment where Severian's kind of been shown in one way or another, Hey, there's a different world. There's a different story going on. You're caught up in it. You may not know the details of it, but this is like your initiation. Right. Yeah. Like that's kind of the moment, but, yeah, it's also just really strange. It seems weird that the Autark would do this without explaining it, especially since it has nothing to do with Vodalus, which seems like the context of this, um, or at least at this point. But yeah, it's still, like you said, it's a very strange scene. Plus, we're never going to know anything else about Zadkula, this angel, for the rest of these four books, right? Right. We're only shown this weird momentary thing where there's a giant angel who's looking at Severian. And yeah, even when you do add in what goes on in Earth, I feel like it doesn't really (laughs) quite explains the scene, right? Yeah, it's more there's there's sort of metaphorical meanings of Severian getting initiated into something weird. But again, the actual logic of the scene still doesn't make sense to me. And, And I don't really understand what the autark is doing here. Yeah. I think the autark thinks that Severian knows so much more. In fact, yeah. I think he, he kind of says that. And also, you know, when he says go, I think he actually, from the autark's perspective, he actually leaves the room and which isn't obvious uh, from Severian's perspective mm. at all. But we, you pick out some of the things he says and it looks like maybe he does. So, maybe to see is actually to travel. So, yeah. 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 He says, yeah, when he says go, he's, he, he goes. And although once again, although, Severian never names the thing in the book. He does identify him in Sword of Lictor as an Amshaspand, the the Commonwealth term for and or version of an angel, a servant of the Increate. What is also a mystery to me is why this little ceremony, Craig, is necessary or what is being imparted to him or why it is so physically stressful. is that explained in Earth and New Sun? Help me out, listeners. I don't I don't know. The Autark slams the giant book shut with a crash. What Severian saw was for him alone. The Autark couldn't see it. He asked, what did you see? And that's why I think maybe Severian wasn't even there. And any reader who never read Earth of the New Sun is asking that very same question. What did you what did he see? <laughs> As Varian says only, quote, thank you, sir, whoever you may be. I am your servant from this time forward. Once again, it's not obvious what this vision meant to Severian. It means something very big. Yeah. And that that phrase there about, you know, I'm thank you and I'm your servant forever. It obviously meant something incredibly serious to Severian, but we're never really he never really tells us what that was exactly. Yeah. Right? I mean, which is something of an odd thing because if this is his journal, 
he certainly could just feel free to say anything he wants to. Sure. Right? Yeah. Um, if it's a political statement, then this would be a good place to, to, to uh, talk about how important he is. Yeah. yeah. And not just mention it and then kind of not explain it. Right. So, so it's another place where I don't really precisely grasp Wolf's intention of not having Severian explain what he felt like he saw. Yeah. What, yeah. what he knew. Um, I feel like our job is to try and explain those things, but with this, the actual way that this is woven into things, I have possibilities, but I don't, I don't know. I don't right. Know really, yeah. Really what it is. Yeah. I wonder, maybe it has some counter effect on the Alzabo drug that is controlling hmm. Severian's allegiance to Vodalus. I mean, he certainly, this is the last time Severian ha- is under any control of, of Vodalus, right? I mean, he, but he's, yeah. he doesn't follow him before, but he's, it, you know, even when it was, when the, the Autark, you know, gives the passcode, he automatically gives him the thing. He didn't, yeah. doesn't think or do anything. He's controlled, but he's not, we don't have that next time he meets Photolus at all. Once again, uh, Severian says, you know, I'm your servant from this time forward. And the Autark says, I-, I may remind you of that promise sometime, but I will not ask you what you saw again. And he hands Severian a clean cloth and says, here, wipe your forehead. The sight has marked you. <laughs> we'll take that term up in a minute. Uh, Severian can actually feel some liquid running down his face. And so he takes the cloth and wipes his face. And holy cats, it's blood. He's bleeding. The Autark can see Severian as alarm. He says, oh, you are not wounded. The physician's term for this is... I should have wrote, wrote this out uh, phonetically like I do usually, but it's a <laughs> hematidrosis, right? Yeah, that'll work. Yep, yep. And he uh, explains that when the body is under great stress through pain or emotions, minute veins, that is capillaries, in the skin of the afflicted part, he pauses, of the skin everywhere sometimes, they rupture during a profuse sweating, and you will have a nasty bruise there, I'm afraid. The Autark has himself gone to take the test, and so I suppose he has had this book opened for him, and I guess he also had this happen to him. He, he doesn't seem to be surprised that this happened to Severian and has become something of an expert about the condition. Um, hematidrosis or hematohydrosis it's a medical condition where you ooze or sweat blood from your skin when you're not cut or injured. Or, or alternatively, you'll cry tears of blood, which is called hemolacria. Or maybe you'll bleed from the ears, otorrhea. It's rare. Uh, there have only been a few actual cases confirmed in medical studies during the 20th century. It usually happens on or around the face, but it might be happening internally inside the skin as well, uh, nose, mouth, or stomach. And the skin around the bloody area might swell for a while. There's also a different condition called chromhydrosis, the sweating of a different color, yellow, blue, green, or black. Uh, it's uh, hematidrosis is not considered serious medically in itself. The bleeding stops on its own, but you might feel dehydrated, and of course, it can freak you out. The truth is that despite what your church youth pastor told you, doctors don't know exactly what <laughs> triggers it because it's so rare. It's just as the autark says, what happens is that the capillaries in your skin burst and then the blood in the capillaries gets squeezed out of your sweat glands or from your hair follicles. It can be a symptom of high blood pressure or some kind of bleeding disorder. Sometimes it's happened to menstruating women. But, and this is where you've probably heard about it, it seems to be caused by extreme distress or fear, such as facing death, torture, or severe ongoing abuse. And as I say, that's where you've probably heard about this condition, because in the Gospel of Luke, 22, 42 through 44, the writer records that when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, just before his arrest and crucifixion on Thursday night or early Friday morning, when he prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then Luke records that an angel appeared and strengthened him. And verse 44, quote, 
and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly than his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So the angel's assistance was only effective to a degree. So the thing is that this is among the various signs that occurred to Christians, sweating blood, but also bleeding from the forehead, which might be the same thing, or bleeding from the palms or feet or both. In some cases, bleeding on the back in the form of whips. There's a word for this, a stigmata. And that brings us back to Severian's conversation with the autarch, because when the autarch hands Severian the cloth, he says the sight has marked you. And of course, the word stigma, stigmata, is just plural for stigma. It literally means mark. So, like the water in the end turning to wine, this is another direct reference to Jesus. Yep. And one thing, I'm glad you you pointed out that the difference between Severian possibly sweating drops of blood and the general way, or in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the general way people often... I think have referred to what happens here as just stigmata because mm-hmm. of, there are lots of reported cases of people claiming to have stigmata, right? Like in, right. Um, you know, religious ecstasies or whatever, their hands will start bleeding is I think typically where it's, it's described or, you know, a lot of horror movies will do stuff like this, right? Where supposedly, you know, they're, they're feeling the passion or whatever. And so literally they start bleeding from the same place that um, Jesus was, was wounded when he was put on the cross. Mm-hmm. Um, that's different though from, you know, that's, it's, it's a small difference. I mean, it still connects it to Jesus, but right. the fact that there actually is, um, shoot, hematidrosis <laughs> or whatever, that there may actually be <laughs> hematidrosis in the Garden of Gethsemane thing is different from those stigmata kinds of, of stories that you get um, for a couple reasons. Like the, the way I think it's even more interesting is because it's showing Jesus under not a real physical pain, but more that mental, emotional despair or almost despair or wherever Mm -hmm. he is that it's, it's not a, it, in other words, it's less of an immediate sign to the resurrection or, or close to, to the cross and more about what Jesus went through before then. Mm -hmm. Um, that's to me is really interesting because that means that we're putting Severian here less as sort of like the, the dead God about to be resurrected, but more about the moment when, you know, Jesus may be least godlike, like one of the moments when he's least godlike in all the stories, because he actually is afraid and is actually being very human for a moment there. Right. I mean, I think that, that that's a really much more kind of, emotional resonance in certain ways, Um, especially for Severian, this young guy who doesn't even know what he's getting himself into. Um, But at the very least, it's just a different kind of illusion. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I think that's important because a lot of times when people bring this up, it's just, oh yeah, it's like he got stigmata. And it's like, well, that's that's not usually how stigmata come about like i know other people have talked about is it the crown of thorns like you know maybe he's bleeding from the stigmata as if as if you know how jesus was bleeding from the forehead Mm -hmm. at with the crown of thorns that could be but i think it's so much more interesting to make it uh more of an allusion to that moment in gethsemane where he's just isolated and afraid and 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 alone um just gives a totally to me at least different kind of of resonance that it's not just, Hey, Jesus in general, <laughs> but it's more, um, you know, it's finding him at a very sort of weak and, and small point where kind of Severian may well be, at least in terms of what he understands. Right. Yeah. So I think it's, it's very interesting. The other thing I wondered is he specifically mentions the bruising. Mm-hmm. Um, the autark does, which just made me wonder, like, is it going to be in the shape of a cross when it, when the bruise comes away? And so, <laughs> no, literally, like, do we have a little sort of shout out to Ash Wednesday here? You know, of, oh, of yeah. like, like yeah. The, the thing on your forehead. Um, so I don't know, I, but yeah. I, I thought that would be kind of a, a different way to think about that bruising, that he's going to be walking around possibly with a little bruise cross on his head oh, that would be um, cool. as if he just, yeah, yeah. He just had mass. Well, and also uh, note that, when Jesus uh, is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's strengthened by an angel, mm-hmm. right? So, yep. and that's is we have that that moment here with uh, Severian, which kind yeah, of that was my next me, one, which yeah. makes me think, you know, 
is Severian, how is Severian being strengthened? Which kind of leads me to my thought, well, maybe, maybe he's, you know, be getting, finally getting free of Vodalus. Mm, I like that too. That's yeah. pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. Now, Severian is, as I mentioned, freaked out. Despite his experience as a torture, he seems to have a bit of a phobia about the sight of his own blood. And he says, why did you do that? <laughs> Which, again, <laughs> is a question I ask as well. <laughs> and uh, Severian says, I thought you were going to show me a map. I just wanted to find the green room where the entertainers are staying. Did Vodalus' message say you were to kill whoever brought you the message? And I, I'll remind you that this threw me for a while, uh, because for a long while I was convinced that this is a signal that the message did say that. But now I realize <laughs> there's no evidence for that. Uh, Severian grabs for his sword, but when he gets his hand on the hilt, he's too weak to draw the blade. And uh, there's a couple of possibilities, I think. Uh, as I said, perhaps the side of Zadkiel in the book has a similar effect to control Severian's allegiance to the Autarch or the allies of the plan of Yasades. So like, you know, when he was carrying Vodalus's message to the House of Absolute, he tried to throw it away several times and just mm -hmm. couldn't. So, so it, you know, it seems like this. You know. Secondly, maybe one of the security measures in the room is a technical operation that secures weapons it discovers so the user can't draw it. I don't know. Sounds like something he would have told Severian, but yeah, whether or not it's... it's nah, he doesn't tell yeah. him anything. <laughs> what would he do with that knowledge? Yeah. <laughs> you might try but it to could also be it. that he really is just weakened from this incredibly... Yeah. You know, it is a stra it is apparently has been a very stressful experience. Yeah. Whether yeah. Severian realizes it or not. Yeah. So one other thing here that this is the fact that he uses the words green room again, mm -hmm. it clicked to me this time that this whole time, what Severian's basically doing is trying to find a garden, right? He's yeah. trying to find a garden where uh, he's going to get back in touch with uh, the woman who he thinks he's in love with. So there is a whole kind of aspect of, of this, that this is, kind of like i mean i like that reminded me too of garden of gethsemane but also if he's talking about getting into a green garden you know is there some kind of moment here where what severian's trying to do in the background is to help get back to garden of eden or find purity again which could be another way of talking about you know getting closer to salvation that he's asking for it but he doesn't really understand all the ways that he's getting more information about how really to get back to the real garden. It also makes me wonder about whatever this is that happened to Severian, that, you know, a green room is where you go to prepare for your performance. Mm -hmm. Is this in some way a preparation of Severian for his own performance? Yeah. And that if this is kind of like an initiation ritual of some form that we're going through, then that makes sense, right? That he's being in some ways set on the path. And then he has a little moment in a green room before he has to really go out and start. Yeah. Serving yeah. his purpose in some way or another. So Severian, of course, is like I said, freaking out, uh, but the autark for his part just laughs. So whether it's, you know, one of those two things uh, or something else, the autark has no fear that Severian will actually kill him. This, as opposed to when the Autark meets Severian in the flyer and is really on guard against the possibility that Thecla inside of Severian will try to kill him. The, the laughter of the Autark is described as, quote, a pleasant laughter at first, wavering somewhere between a woman's and a boy's, but it trailed off into tittering as a drunken man's sometimes does. And then, quote, Thecla's memories stirred in me Almost they woke. <laughs> How does he keep Thecla under wraps? Yeah, I don't. She knows I, what he looks like. Although I guess maybe there's just too much weirdness and stress going mm. on otherwise maybe. here. And that, that, that makes some sense. But I like, too, that we're reminded, first of all, of his sort of hybrid sexuality first. Mm -hmm. Of, you know, oh, it's kind of like a woman's, kind of like a boy's. And then it becomes slightly broken, right? Like the right. tittering is when things get like, oh uh wait is this guy okay you know or we're like <laughs> oh that's it's the first moment where he seems not like you know a wise man who's showing him secrets and now more uh, of a crazy guy yeah, yeah yeah which is 
a question, I think. Like, like how really are we supposed to see the autark at this point? Like, are we supposed to see him as in control very much? Yeah. Or are we supposed to see him as kind of, you know, unpredictable because we've got him connected to Vodalus somehow, who's supposed to be his enemy. Uh, and as soon as Severian makes that connection and we see that this, oh, this is the autark and not just the weird old pimp, um, then things get like exponentially weirder, right? Because right. we're not, then we really don't know what to think about him. Um, you know, do we hate him? Are we supposed to like him? Does he like Severian? Is he helping Severian? What's he actually working for? What's going on? And, you know, the, just the questions and the possibilities just proliferate at that point, I feel like to know like, okay, what's the actual story here? What is Severian <laughs> working yeah. on? What side is he on? What do those sides mean? And I feel like as soon as you get the identification of the autark, that's also when you get that tittering and it's so perfect because it's just confusing. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's just, it's totally, and it still is confusing to me. Like it just, I have sort of like possibility set out of what all these things mean. Right. But yeah. I mean, is, is the autark is if, if this is, if he really is Appian, who I think he is, that's, we find out his name later. Mm. Appian's a weird dude. Like he's been <laughs> slightly messed up by all this stuff. <laughs> you well, know, he could he's have always not, been a yeah. kind of a weird, awkward guy, you know, right. but I guess too, once you get a million other voices in your head, that yeah. doesn't help. No, yeah. no. And you know, if you if this is your first time reading it and you you've you met this this autark and he laughs and then Severian says, almost Thecla's memories woke. And then you say, Wait a minute, wait a minute. You should be paying attention and saying, Hey, there's something something here that has to do with Thecla. Yeah. But then the autark says, Oh, you only wanted to find the way to the green room? And he says, you asked me for a light for your candle, and I tried to give you the sun, and now you're burned. Sorry about that. So once again, the autark seems to have believed that Severian knew more than he did. He says, oh, look, here's the book. You know the book. <laughs> yeah, then yeah. go get that down. And then he shows him all this. Hey, you, are you ready to go? Are you ready to go? But and really, you know, Severian had no idea what was going on. And this is when the uh, autark finally realizes it. He says, um, it's kind of oddly phrased here. He says, I saw perhaps to postpone my time, yet even I would not have let you travel so far had I not read the message that you carried the claw. And now I am most truly sorry, but I cannot help but laugh. So four parts here. I saw it perhaps to postpone my time then Yet even so, I would not have let you travel so far. Then had I not read the message that you carried the claw, and then, and now I am most truly sorry, but I cannot help but laugh. So I think the easiest reading, like I said, is I chose to put off our meeting, but I only made you go through the book because you, I read that you carried the claw, mm -hmm. right? Seems like, yeah. But that's, uh, I don't know, that's not what he said. He, he's only now, like I said, he's only now read the message that Severian uh, carried the claw. So that's when he made this decision. So, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, I think it means, yeah. So we know, as we find out later, right, that that the Autark, whether because of Aniri or whatever, knows that Severian somehow we know that Severian is coming. He's going to be the next Autark. And so what the Autark is really mentioning here is I thought. And he's a, a, not only is he going to be the out, next Autark, but he will take the test. Yeah. Right? And, At least also, he will take the test. Or right? maybe he knows that he, he's going to pass a test. I don't know. Right. But he, he is happy. He he's We're told he's he was very happy when he heard of him. Right. But also the way I read it is that if Severian's supposed to become the Autark, he's going to have to eat our guy's brain here, old Autark's yeah. brain. In other words, he's going to have to kill him, right? And so right. he says, I sought to to put off our meeting a little bit. You know, I wanted to live a little longer. You know, he knows that he's just part of this longer sort of procession of Autarchs. He knows that if Severian is supposed to be the next Autark, as apparently he is, then he was going to have to kill him. That's something, by the way, you you can't make that connection when he says that until you reread it because you don't know that our Turks are supposed to kill each other at this point. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, or at least eat each other or whatever. Um, but to me, that's what that part is immediately referring to when he says, I chose to put off our meeting a little bit or to postpone my time. 
Um, that's what I think he means. Like, I just wanted to live a little bit longer. Um, and so he thought that Severian had somehow been informed of his role in this too. Uh, but obviously he wasn't. And so that's yeah. one reason why he's laughing. Why else? He's probably thinking, uh, why else would he be carrying the claw, the claw, the yeah. claw yeah. of the conciliator? Yeah. And, I, you know, I presume he knows all the things that are connecting Severian to the conciliator. So yeah. if it's he's yeah. carrying his own claw, he knows a lot. He knows yeah. he's gone off and claimed his own you know, symbol. Yeah. Now, how he knows that? I don't know. I mean, my answer would be because of Aniri. OK, well, how does Aniri know that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, is it because of first Severian? Is it because of being Yasadi and from a different dimension? I mean, we don't, we don't know, but yeah, but, yeah. but that to me is the clearest idea that at the very least, what we know about this conspiracy is that someone has chosen at this point, Severian to be the next Autark. Appian knows that I, sorry, I call him Appian. I, I just, cause that's, no, that's yeah, the name we get for him. It's later. believable. Yeah. I think so. Um, but old Autark or, or, the androgyne or whatever he's he knows that it's going to be severian and when he says i wanted to just postpone my time a little bit that's mm -hmm. clear to me at least. you think oh maybe yeah maybe i i, oh, guess. I, know, there, I know there's plenty of people don't agree with that if i understood <laughs> why severian was looking at that book maybe I, that would be clear that uh, would be better yeah now as far as why does he then say oh and let me show you this angel and show you some yeah. metaphysical truths about the universe and whatnot oh, i don't really know unless he just assumes that because he's he knows he's gonna be caught up in this thing he knows everything about the whole context which yeah. Severian knows nothing about the context yeah he thinks yeah he the author you know he um he sent him on this trip through the mirror to the edge of the universe because yeah, he figured he was a major player, and now he realizes that Severian is still just a pawn on his way down the board to be made a mm -hmm. queen. Yep. That's what I think. Yeah. At this point, the Autark has realized, I think, that there's just still a lot of story left to play out, and he just wants to know, you know, where it is. He says, yeah. so after you find the green room, where are you going to go next? And Severian says, I'll go wherever you send me. Maybe this is true, or maybe it's not. Severian is playing the role of a dutiful servant of Vodalus, remember, because he thinks that that's what this guy is. On the other hand, he did promise to be his servant forevermore. So still, you know, uh, Severian reveals that you know, although Severian doesn't admire or follow Vodalus in his heart, he does fear Vodalus, and he fears what this little spy will tell Vodalus, maybe. So, so the Autarch says, okay, all right, you're going to go wherever I send, send you, fine. What if I don't have any orders for you? Where will you go then? Did you already throw away the claw? Severian admits that he was unable to throw the claw away. He's admitting that while Vodalus considers the claw dangerous to his mission, not because he thinks it has powers, that it's still considered precious by Severian himself. And the Autark doesn't say anything. Lord knows what he's thinking. He just stands there looking at Severian. At last, Severian declares that he's going to go to Thrax, where he has a job waiting. And he says, for the honor of my guild, I would like to go. And then the Autark pushes even farther. I don't know what he knows about Severian. It seems not more than the basics and the rote facts of what has happened in the mansion. He asks, mm -hmm. quote, how great in truth, is your love for Vodalus? Whoa. Big, complicated question. <laughs> Again, I felt the haft of the axe in my hand. For you others, as I am told, memory dies. Mine scarcely dims. The mist that shrouded the necropolis that night blew against my face again, and everything I had felt when I received the coin from Vodalus and watched him walk away to a place where I could not follow returned to me. I saved him once, I said. Uh, this is actually pretty telling for the Autark, I think. It's like someone asking, are you in love with your fiancé? And you respond, we've shared a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. That's an answer to the question simply because you chose not to answer the question. It says, you think I loved her a lot, given our history, but that was in the past. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Autark... Instructions are interesting. It's one of those instructions that could 
only be significant on a second read or only after you've come to some kind of personal opinion about what's going on. He says, here are my instructions. You have to go to Thrax. And during the whole time, you need to tell everyone, even yourself, that you're going there to take the job that's waiting for you there. Fill the position that waits for you there. So I think that is what the autark means. He doesn't know what Severian saw when he, as I suppose now, entered the book. For all he knows, he might have, you know, mess things up already by showing him too much. Mm. He realizes yeah. that the steps will have to play themselves out as they will. He doesn't want Severian to mess things up with too much knowledge, but he knows that Severian is not going to become Lictor of Thrax and retire there very soon, not very long at all. The Odd Tark knows that he is going to encounter Severian north of Thrax on the battlefields of the war with the Asia. And that at that point, he's going to become Autark. So he's comforted that Severian is moving in the right direction, even though maybe he didn't expect that, but he knows he, things are going to play out differently. And if Severian figures out that, you know, it will be different, he wants Severian playing his role in his own play. That's foreshadowing in my part. <laughs> From the Autark's point of view, he's instructing Severian to go north in disguise as himself, the humble, exiled torturer. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Which I also like, too, because it means that the Autark here is not as all-seeing as no, I think no. sometimes... Yeah, in the Earth List and other places, we have a tendency to see that the Autark seems to be in on all of it. But actually, this guy is not in area, maybe, but this guy... It's right. Not. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, at one point, I mean, we we do we get a story about the the first Severian, and you know, he he encounters the Autark entirely by chance, and yeah. so now he realizes he gets a little hint of the bigger game going on, but he doesn't know if he's screwing it up. He doesn't know. No one's yeah. given him a rule book for, for how to do this. So the next part is even more strange. He says, "Quote: The claw is perilous. Are you aware of it?" And Severian replies, oh, yeah, Vodalus told me that if it became known that we have it, we might lose support of the populace. But the Autark just looks at him. <laughs> That's not no, what he meant by no, no, no. the claw is perilous. And he finally says, quote, the Pelerines are in the north. If you're given the opportunity, you have to return it to them. And Severian says, well, that's not what I wanted to do. And the Autark says, good, I'll show you one more thing that you have to do. The Autark is here. But long before you reach Thrax, he's going to be in the north, too, with the army. If he comes near Thrax and you're able to go to him, in time you will discover the way in which you must take his life. Bon -ta -bon. <laughs> so, yeah, he says, his tone betrayed him as much as Thecla's thoughts. Which, for me, on the first read, uh, would mean, you know, not much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but what's going on is Severian is suddenly keyed to the fact that this is actually the autark right mm -hmm. yeah so and, I, and the autarks just commanded him to kill him someplace up in the north yep yep and so it's that it's like for the first time he doesn't he's not suggesting things he's not saying let me show you this book it's like you will do this now you will do this and you will you will discover the way in which you must take his life so he's speaking with authority all of a sudden and so then severian says i wanted to kneel but he clapped his hands and a bent little man slipped silently into the room. He wore a cowled habit like a Cenobite's. The Autark spoke to him, something I was too distracted to understand. And I was too distracted on my first read to actually pick up on that. that yep, that's, this is where he, he labels the Androgyne as the Autark. Yeah. Everything before this moment, he's still been the, uh, the Androgyne from the House Azure. But this is the, I mean, we've been talking about him as the Autark, but this is the, it's only now that Severian actually clues in the Thecla's thoughts kick in right that he sees him acting with authority 
And so now is when all that stuff that he's like, oh, wait a minute, but this is the autark. So the autark is the spy against himself for Vodalus. Wait a minute. How does that work? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. he doesn't spend any time th thinking about, wait a minute, wait a minute. I need some clarification here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and doesn't have any chance to do something. He's just sort of, you know, he slack jawed for a second because he says this little servant comes in here, but he was so distracted and overwhelmed that he either couldn't understand what the guy was saying or just was so not paying attention that his, right. his vaunted memory can't bring it back. Uh, Cinnabite, as we mentioned yeah. earlier, is a monk. In some online dictionaries, it also says it's a, quote, social bee, but I can't <laughs> find an etymology or usage example of it. I suppose that- It is a hellraiser is what it is, of course. Yeah, well, yes, of course, it's the Cinnabites, <laughs> yes. Um, I, and I suppose this is the first time and the last time in this book that Severian is going to encounter Father Aniri as himself. Uh, perhaps we do encounter him in other forms. So, yeah, that's that's something we should talk about uh, <laughs> because we've been saying even before you and I have been saying, yeah, we never actually see Father Aniri. And I got to admit, I totally forgot about this little cinema. Yeah, yeah, which, yeah, we do. We'll barely see him, really. Yeah. And and let's be honest, it's not absolutely clear that this is an airing, mm -hmm. but uh, kind of fits. Yeah. I mean, how how could he not be? <laughs> is he a small person? You know, maybe monkey like. We, he doesn't call him monkey like, but. Um, no, no, but he does. Use, interesting. He does uh, use a synonym for monk. So. Yeah. Uh, ah, yeah. yep. I like that. That's a, that's a wolf pun. That's <laughs> that monk monkey. Yeah. Monkey. Like that's not Simeon, but he does a monkey. Oh, monk. -y. Huh? I had never really thought about that before, but that's a wolf. That's right probably there. is a pun. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Ah, wolf. I hate you sometimes. So. <laughs> and this, uh, Cowled figure, whoever he may be, directs a variant to the green room, but it leads him, you know, by way of the Vatic fountain, the fountain that predicted when Thecla was an infant that she would sit on the throne. Mm -hmm. And Thea always envied her for that. And you all know what that I think this is irony on Wolf's part, not only because Thecla will sit on the throne as Severian, but because, um, you know, I think Thea did in another universe as well but that's neither here nor there um let's just read on so before we do that though there's one one more thing about the center bike we do have a little bit more curiositas urthus from the earth for that curiositas urthus i was searching through um old earthless things about the cenobite to see and sure enough a couple people had noticed him before and suggested that he is uh an earring uh -huh. but what i had forgotten was that actually this little figure pops up again in citadel um oh in and i could not remember so or, or i could so this is what um dan rabin who i don't remember him but he had suggested this he was saying borsky says we never see him but um he does see him so in citadel in chapter 28 on the march uh, we get this little bit. Um, so I think this is this is him. So first he says, for guides, our column had three savages, a pair of young men who might have been brothers or even twins, and a much older one, twisted, I thought, by deformities as well as age, who perpetually wore a grotesque mask. <laughs> Though the first two were younger and the third much older, all three of them recalled to me the naked man I had once seen in the jungle garden. They were as naked as he and had the same dark metallic looking skin and straight hair. And then, oh. uh, later on, he says, and one night when my guards were chattering among themselves and I sat crouched over our little fire, I saw the old guide, his bent figure and the impression of an immense head conferred by his mask were unmistakable. I saw him approach this palanquin, which was holding the old autark, and slip beneath it. Some time passed before he scuttled away. This old man was said to be an Uturunku, a shaman capable of, assume, of assuming the form of a tiger. So... So what Dan had said was that he thought that maybe this was also a Neri, that because you get the sort of sort of hooded sort of mm -hmm. bent figure that maybe this could be him again. 
So wearing a it, mask, wearing a mask, yeah, wearing like a mask, a, and also then later in in Citadel in chapter thirty five, um, Rudison says that Father Aniri quote went away north, um, but he doesn't want to dwell on it. And Severian says back to me, he says, "We even know that your master was with us in the jungles of the north, where he tried until it was too late to rescue my predecessor." Um, <laughs> and even Aniri's letter talks about recent events up north uh, that suggest that he knew what was going on so if that is him i mean i don't know that he's necessarily the same guy but um i like that idea that 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 might be another place where we see an area and the fact that he's also still this um small dude you know yeah so yeah um, and nick gevers kind of responded to that and was uh, like that you know he that what he does is we're about to see he does take the severian through many quote many leagues of the contrived corridors of the second house to get there which is a whole weird like confidential route that goes right yeah all the way through so anyway yep so there is some there's other other folk who think that there's some connections that this could be an area and that we might see him again even in one other place yeah all right yeah all right. I'll, I'll keep my eye out for that one Okay, but now, now we actually move on a little bit. So. Yeah, this cowed figure, whoever he is, uh, directs very into the green room, but it leads him by way of the Vatic Fountain, the fountain that predicted when Thecla was an infant that she would sit on the throne, and Thea always envied her for that. And I think that that's uh, double irony on Wolf's part, because, of course, Thecla will sit on the throne, by way of Severian, but I also believe that uh, Thea sat on the throne in a previous iteration. But let's just let's just read on. <laughs> in all the world, there can be few sights more beautiful than that of the sun at dawn, seen through the thousand sparkling waters of the Vatic Fountain. I am no esthete, but my first sight of its dance, of which I had so often heard, must have acted as a restorative. I still recall it for my pleasure, just as I saw it when the cowled servitor opened a door for me, after so many leagues of the contrived corridors of the second house, and I watched the silver streams trace ideographs across the solar disk. Look at that. He just kind of roughly brushes aside the fact that he that he had to lead him through a whole bunch of corridors in order to get to this point. Yeah. Of the second house, even, right? Right, And, and yeah. he specifically says, and they were definitely weird. So... Straight ahead, the cowled figure murmured. Follow the path through the gate of trees. You'll be safe among the players. The door shut behind me and became the grassy slope of a hillock. I stumbled toward the fountain, which refreshed me with wind-blown spray. I was surrounded by a pavement of serpentine. For a time, I stood there seeking to read my fortune in the dancing shapes, and at last, I fumbled in my saber tash for an offering. So, finally, we have got to the hydromancy <laughs> that yep. the chapter promised. And this is like a, you know, a regular fountain where you throw a coin in for good luck to know who you're going to marry or something. But in this case, it seems to work and people believe it does anyway. And the stones are green. Either that's their natural color or they're covered with algae or moss from the water or the fountain. The point I think is that we have the blue waters and the green pavement. But uh, Severian doesn't have a coin. The Praetorians took all his money. He's back to zero. He digs around his saber tash, and let's see, there's a flannel to polish his sword. There's half a whetstone for sharpening his sword. Remember, he gave the other half to the green man. Uh, there's oil for his sword. There's a comb, I suppose, to keep him, you know, looking smart. Yep. And there's the brown book. Nope, nothing to throw in the fountain. But in the crack of a paving stone, he sees a silver asimi, quote, worn so thin that there was hardly a trace of the imprint remained. And we have the blue sky and the green pavement, heaven and earth. And here we have a silver star or perhaps the moon. I don't know what, if anything, specifically Wolf intended to convey astronomically, but <laughs> all the pieces are there. He literally makes a wish. We don't know what the wish was, but then he throws it into the center of the fountain. So I guess it's the North Star. Probably that is not Polaris for Severian, but it, you know, <laughs> it certainly is for us. In the center of the water, a jet catches it and throws it into the sky where it flashes and falls 
uh, you know, a procession metaphor, and the pole star falls from its place in the sky. And immediately, Severian records, quote, I began to read the symbols the water made against the sun. The symbols are a sword, then a rose, then under it a river and angry waves, then a rod, then a chair, then multitudes of towers, and then a many pointed star growing ever larger. Okay, well, some of that sounds very familiar and some of mm-hmm. it doesn't. Yeah. And now when Severian tries to interpret the symbols, he thinks the sword is obvious. He'll continue to be a torturer. <laughs> but any reader of uh, Wolf should guess that when an interpreter of symbols or clues thinks the solution is obvious, obvious. then yeah. it's a sure indication that they are wrong. The sword, uh, you know, might mean that he's going to war. Uh, something Severian does not imagine for himself at this point, but something that's, you know, definitely happened to the first Severian and yep. something the Autark half suspected at least. But he was open to the possibility that you know, that the course of time would lead himself instead to close to Thrax. And that seemed clear enough. He says, I would continue as a torturer. Um, the next symbols uh, a rose and then a river underneath it. A Severian just discounts the rose and assumes it means that he'll follow the guy to Thrax. But we know that the rose is probably refers to the thorn where he's plucked on the finger and the, a thorn that becomes a claw, the relic of the conciliator, even though that event only vaguely is confirmed in this book that Severian's going to become the conciliator. Yeah. And you could also see them as a sword gets replaced by a rose, that he replaces his torturingness eventually with his healing power, yeah. um, which is kind of what happens eventually for real. But yeah. Yeah. Now the river, I suppose it is Severian taking his boat ride to the citadel. Then a rod, is that a scepter? And a chair, is that a throne? Uh, and a multitude of towers. It seems like the citadel, but I'm not honestly very positive. I, honestly, I feel like, I, I feel like for, I'm Severian interpreting these signs now. For the river, I feel like that's travel. I don't I don't yeah. know if that's exactly it, but we do get right lots of travel. Right. Yeah, it, it depends on how you're going to look at these like so the way that he lists them like then under under a river then angry waves then a rod then a chair yeah. multitude it seems like that's leading up to him maybe being the autark right with rod and yeah a chair. sounds like yeah general yeah but you could also the river could also be his travel on the ship right to the right. something else and maybe that's the test because you get the angry waves which could well be the flood right we're gonna we're gonna get there but right. so there's there's different ways you could interpret like is this about the four books of the book of the new sun, or is it talking about what happens afterward? Right. There's there's different ways we could do this, but yeah, so we're sorry. We're still going through. (laughs) (laughs) But Severian is even more confused than me. He's decided that this is all rubbish because he hasn't seen the fountain foretell a single excruciation. (laughs) It's just bunk. But just as he's turning away, the fountain reveals a mini pointed star growing ever larger. Well, That doesn't take much interpretation for anyone who's read Earth of the New Sun, but consider how it played the first time for readers in 1981 or even 1983 when they'd read the whole book of the New Sun. This symbol, I think, Severian understands at this point because of what he says next. Yeah. Since I returned to the House Absolute, I have twice revisited the Vatic Fountain. Once I came at the first light, approaching it through the same door through which I first glimpsed it, but I've never again dared to ask it questions. <laughs> Why do you think he has never dared to ask it any more questions? I, I think, I know what I think. I think it's because this last symbol is for him so hopeful that he doesn't want to try again for fear he'll get something different. And <laughs> maybe he's queered the deal somehow. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Yep. Also, notice that some of the symbols are the same in the funeral bronze and mm-hmm. in the necropolis, but they are not entirely the same. There's a fountain, there's waters, there's a ship, Volant, and there's a rose. He, even if you assume that the bronze was meant to be read in the opposite direction, rose, ship, water, fountain, yeah, well, it's, a, it's hard to view the symbols sequentially, but by the same token, it's hard to line them up with these symbols uh, the way as much as I'd like. But I don't know. The difference appeals to me since I think 
the body in the necropolis is not our Severian, but the first Severian. But I can can't really feel triumph because I don't feel like I can emphatically state what those symbols mean anyway. Mm-hmm. Did Wolf intend a specific meaning to those symbols? Did he yeah. mean for us to connect them with this symbol generating the Vatic Fountain? Yeah. I don't know. One thing I like, there's a, a Renaissance, um, I, I call it an essay, but it's by Sir Philip Sidney um, called An Apology for Poetry. And there were those kinds of things were really popular back then because the the sort of general assumption was, oh, poetry is all just lies and and it's going to corrupt you because it's all about the senses and so that's every, what i was raised to believe that's all i yeah. know <laughs> <laughs> but so every writer every poet would write apologies for poetry and defense of, of poetry um but in the one that sydney writes uh he says the reason why it's good is what he specifically calls poets or just any fiction writer is vates um that that's like like the vatic fountain he says they're Mm. they are vates and what they do is it's the historian's job to say things that are literally true but what a poet does is lies for a higher purpose because Mm. their lies reach basically for him he calls it a moral truth and, and other things like that but what that means though is that of course you get all that freedom to lie. And so exactly <laughs> how the moral or the universal truths tie up with the actual history, you got tons and tons of freedom. So what, what Sydney eventually does is he, he gets to kind of have his cake and eat it too. He's like, well, I do lie all the time in my book, but I lie <laughs> for a good purpose, but he has all the freedom and fun in which to lie. And so, yeah, that's kind of the same point here and i like it just works too that he uses the same word as the vedic fountain that you get all these yeah, symbols yeah. which can mean like the star coming that can mean salvation and a good ending but the manner in which you're going to get to that could take lord only knows how many different ways so um yeah so so that's kind of the both the beauty and the frustration of especially these kinds of fortune telling symbols right because you can right. interpret and uninterpret and reinterpret them many ways so i wonder what in what wolf thought this fountain was it supposed to be real like was it supposed to actually have some yeah truth? yeah or was it literally just uh yeah, a random, random symbol generator yeah exactly <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it's supposed to work or I mean the exaltants certainly seem to believe it works and mm-hmm. you know they're probably among the least ignorant to how the world works, right? Yeah. 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 But, you know, if we believe it works, you know how? Once again, you yeah. know, how does it work? <laughs> this is the most unexplained future tech in the whole book for me. Since it's in the House Absolute, I assume Aneri put it there, but I don't understand its purpose. It's just an article of wonderment. It's something we might see in a Jack Vance story, right? Yeah. It this definitely has that that Vance Dying Earth thing really well because what, what Vance does in Dying Earth is fun because he just has his wizards casting spells, but it's technology, right? It's right. like he has them do all kinds of crazy magical stuff with no even pretending to explain how. Um, but Still, you're told, no, it really is. It's all science. Yeah. <laughs> but you get all the D&D spells. And that's where the yeah, 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 yeah. spells came from. Right. Yeah. But, and it's very, in, it's never 100% on how or if the fountain works. Yeah. He says, uh, my servants who confess one and all that they've dropped their orichalks into it when the garden was clear of guests, tell me one and all that they've received no true prophecy for their money. Yet I'm unsure recalling the green man who drove off his visitors with his accounts of their futures. May it not be that these servants of mine, seeing only a lifetime of trays and brooms and ringing bells, reject it? I've asked my ministers as well, who doubtless cast in Crisos by the handful, but their answers are doubtful and mixed. In this reverie, we get a callback to both the green man and the ringing of bells. Yeah. But I do like that idea that, yeah, if you're going to live a boring life, then <laughs> then, then <laughs> seeing your fortune is something you don't really want to believe because it's right. just, the, yeah. Yeah, there's no dark, you know, handsome, dark stranger or anything yeah. like that. There's there's no, you're soon going to take a trip. Nope, you're going to uh, be cleaning out these chamber pots. <laughs> 
Zavarian chooses, though, not to stand around studying the fountain. He turns his back on the fountain and faces east, where uh, the sun is at last rising. And Zavarian records, Huge as a giant's face, and darkly red it showed as the horizon dropped away. And here's another instance which demonstrates that in Zavarian's culture, they're well aware that the sun is fixed mm -hmm. and the horizon moves. And you could interpret this to mean that, you know, the sun is a red giant at this point, but I think instead it simply refers to the fact that the sun is, you know, it always looks bigger on the horizon. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of callbacks, we get it seems a reference to Severian nearly drowning in the guile, some gear and some change back. Mm. The poplars of the grounds were silhouetted against the sun, making me think of the figure of night atop the con on this western bank of Guile, which I had so often seen with the sun behind it at the close of one of our swimming parties. I think this means something, but I'm not sure what. Um, you know, what is it? What does it mean this here at yeah, the, the leaving night. the Vatic Fountain to have this memory of you know the night that he met Jaterna. I don't know. Yeah, that I'm not sure either. And I was also trying to think, is this something about like, I don't know, cycles, like going back to the beginning, mm. remembering where it all began with, with that figure of night in the first chapter right. or something. I, yeah, but I'm not really sure. Well, Severian is on top of the House Absolute, but he's also now deep within the borders of the House Absolute, where the Praetorians never go. But Severian doesn't realize that. And being out here in the open, he worries that he's going to get stopped and arrested again, despite the fact that Aneri told him he wouldn't be. And he figures that everybody knows about that secret door and they'll have secured it by now. But of course, you know, that never happens. And we just get some description of the surrounding area. So far as I could see, no one stirred in all the leagues of hedge and velvet lawn flower and trickling water, except myself. Lilies far taller than I, their star-shaped faces, spangled with unshaken dew, overhung the path. Its perfect surface showed behind me only the disturbance of my own feet. Nightingales, some free, some suspended from the branches of trees and golden cages, were singing still. Once I saw before me, with something of the old feeling of horror, one of the walking statues. Like a colossal man, though it was not a man, too graceful and too slow to be human, it came across a small secret of lawn as if moving to the inaudible notes of some strange processional. I confess I hung back until it had passed, wondering if it could sense me where I stood in the shadow, and if it cared that I stood so. Just when I had despaired of finding the gate of trees, I saw it. There was no mistaking it. Even as lesser gardeners espalier pears against a wall. Yeah, an, es uh, an espalier that pears against a wall is producing pear fruit. An espalier is a tree or shrub in Severian's metaphor, a pear tree. A tree that is trained to grow in a flat plane against a wall or along a trellis, maybe, in a symmetrical pattern or fan shape. The purpose is to make sure that each branch can create fruit that gets an even amount of sun. Hmm. So I like this because it's kind of a cool, I don't know, to go back to the garden idea, the, like the possible Garden of Eden. If what we're getting here is this sort of pastoral moment of sort of a beautiful garden, that image of really being artificial, but still being something that is created, maybe... <sighs> Maybe that's a bit like saying, you know, Severian can bring salvation. He can bring the garden back intentionally, that it doesn't hmm. have to be randomly. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to think about, yeah, what it, it's a very sort of still very, I mean, we've just talked about explicit symbols, but all this right. stuff here of things being very calm and very, you know, pleasant and, you know, what you need to see is right there and it you, you find what you need. It, everything's like moving easily and pleasantly for Severian here in these last few minutes. So, yeah. Yeah. So he says, even as lesser gardeners espalier pears against a wall with the object of securing for the plant a freer circulation of air, as well as better exposure to the sun, there you go, better exposure to the sun, the greater gardeners of the house absolute who have generations in which to complete their work had molded the huge limbs of oaks 
until every twig conformed to an inspiration wholly architectural. And I, walking on the rooftops of the greatest palace of earth, with not a stone in sight, saw looming to one side that great green entranceway built of living wood as if of masonry. I ran then. At last, Craig, a chapter that ends properly. <laughs> yeah, I, this whole last little section kind of got me because it's it's a lot doesn't happen. And usually when a lot's not happening, we get Severian uh, talking <laughs> a lot. And, and he's not yeah. filling space here. But it is kind of cool how there's this sort of beautiful, peaceful, pleasant way that everything has been made. Um, made to be productive, right? Not just beautiful, mm -hmm. but actually to, you know, to make fruit and how- to And have... to, yeah, and to make gates and yeah, to and make architecture. Yeah, and... yeah. And better exposure to the sun. But even that thing about what he's, what does he make? A gate, right? Like like a gate to a new area, something that right. he's been trying to get to. So, yeah, I feel like this is maybe after he saw the symbols, this is a little moment of hope here that, that maybe- who knows, yes. maybe putting him on the path and seeing Zadkiel, all of this is is kind of a happy, hopeful moment for him. Yeah. Um, so to think about hydromancy, then we know that, especially in Earth of the New Sun, water is going to be a horrible thing, but it does lead to better <laughs> stuff, right? The flood comes, but that actually leads to evolution. That, that flood is a gate to something else. So yeah, there's a, a lot of ways you can kind of mix up I feel like the symbols of this to, to make it be kind of showing a hopeful story for Severian in the end. And I do feel like in the end, this is kind of a happy chapter. Like this is, yeah, yeah. He knows he's going to be reunited. He's had nothing but good memories in the last little bit. Right. He's yeah. very happy with about having seen the big butterfly angel thing. And he's very, and he's encountered the autark. Uh, He's had a Vatic fountain, which didn't show him spinning life of drudgery, although he's a little disappointed not seeing any excruciations. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's still Severian. Yeah. It's been, yeah, this has been a very, uh, this has been, for, for Severian, this has been a pretty, pretty good little chatter. He hasn't yeah. been so happy since being at the Manichin, I think. Yeah, so. no. And he's actually about to be back in close to the the woman who he probably loved second most <laughs> maybe yeah. i don't i don't know if he loved thecla more or, but, but the one woman who's not inside his head he's about to get close <laughs> well i don't know the agia's got inside of his head pretty no, that's true so, that is true yeah. that is true well so i i think we must have left a lot on the table here though craig there's I, there's a lot and this is definitely a, a chapter that's working on a bunch of different levels. It's working on implication for the plot. It's obviously working on symbolic levels in all kinds of ways. So I do feel like if, if you've got different, totally different takes on this, I would not be surprised. So yeah, this yeah. is one where I think we can definitely, I mean, certainly those symbols, everybody's going to, I mean, it's fortune telling. Everybody's going to look at the tarot cards differently. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's that's what we got here. So um, if you feel like there's a different story being told or even what I'm even more interested in is if you've got a better way to line up what happens in this chapter with some of the stuff in Earth, especially around Zadkiel, that's that's what I would really like more help on. That's yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 And if you've got that along with corrections, complaints, then go ahead and bring them to us on the Facebook group, subreddit, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, email, or the Patreon site. And you can find out how to do all that on the show notes. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your wolf-reading friends. And until you hear from us next, may the Moira favor you.
cupboard. There's a monster. There's a monster at the end of this book. Good night, moon. Good night, star. Good night, air. Good night, noises everywhere. Well, there's a walking in my pocket and a horn in the loop. A very hungry caterpillar on the loop. Oh, yeah. Butterfly in the sky. I can go twice as high. Take a look. Sorry about that. Too much, yeah. too much coffee <laughs> after 9 p.m. <laughs> but part of it is just that the, that other PC is crap and the Wi-Fi doesn't really connect. I've got the extender right outside the door here. It well, I wonder, I don't know if it's like, I don't know if it's the, just pause I don't the, know what's going on. Pause the recording. We'll fix it. Just pause. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so wait, did we do your, did you say, did I skip? Did I just miss your thing about? No, the, no, the, I, the, I decided we covered it enough. There's no oh, reason. To, okay. Yeah. Okay. Which I, which I had so, eh, let me just do this over again. The poplars of the grounds were silerated. <laughs> the poplars of the grounds and his lesser gardeners, espalier. Was it espalier? I, that's the way I pronounce it, but then yeah. I don't pronounce it. I just read it. Yeah. <laughs> it's Even a weapon. Le- nothing to do with it being, be, you know, we have to try again. Not the, the int- entrance of the 45 well, minutes crazy plus, yeah and, and the next one's going to be even i don't i don't know what to do with the next one the large it's because of these you know it does it's like they don't look like they ought to have a lot going on but it's the yeah, what these things that don't have real action there's just no, every we, little word is and something we connect up to other stuff so much like i mean we got zed right we got the autark we got an eerie we got, right exactly you know, and then you got all the crazy weird symbol stuff at the end which all you can do is riff <laughs> 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 Well, cool. Last time, too, is that Fetch in here, uh, Rius and being there. And- well, I mean, I know, I know, I, I don't, I'm not an expert on Gnosticism. I, I do recognize Wolf, although I sometimes I do well, some, some of the, some of the old, more esoteric Gnosticism. Mm-hmm. I do they, kind of pick up, like, I, I, there was one point I said, oh, look at that. Silk is, is this figure from Gnosticism. He's a, where he carries a, a has a lion's head and he carries a snake. Oh, I should post that picture for uh, a wolf and Rosemary at the mermaid bar in Galveston. That always makes me think of that guy <laughs> with his, but he's got his pipe out there and he's got his great, <laughs> he just looks, he's young and cool, has hair and thin. 